Welcome, everybody, to uh, October 23 Global r and I'm very happy to present the agenda today. We have two sections. One is on the updates and one is on uh, demos. Uh, for the updates, uh, we'll have some ICP metrics by Kyle. Then we talk about how you can do some local canister testing with ROS. Then we talk about neuron funds and how we have done some or, or working on some, some enhancement, how the neuron fund can uh, participate in SNS launches. Then we give an update on, on ICP on East that we have done lately. So very exciting stuff here. Then uh, the second part will be demos. The first one will be on Motoko stable regions. Then Diego will uh, present his latest uh, LLM used for ICP docs that should uh, make developers' lives much easier. Then we uh, finish with last but not certainly least, the community demo by Agor app. And I'm very much looking forward to that as well. Uh, with that, uh, let's hand over to Kyle. And uh, I'm really curious, Kyle, how is ICP doing lately apart from what Coin Market Cap shows us? <laughs> Thanks, Jan. Appreciate it. Yeah, let's start with uh, inflation metrics. It's been a while since I've talked inflation. Um, so just to give a quick update, right now we're on pace to finish 2023 with an inflation rate of 3.8%. Um, so that's ICP minting uh, and burning. Uh, so it, when you look down at that, there's been almost 15 million ICP minted already in 2023. Uh, and when you actually kind of break it down to figure out like, okay, what, what's causing the inflation? Uh, we have almost 50% of that is spawned maturity. Um, so again, that's, you know, voting rewards that people are um, uh, spawning into ICP and then doing whatever they, they do with it. I've seen examples where they send it to exchanges. I've seen examples where people use it for uh, SNS swaps, um, that kind of stuff. Uh, it's kind of a, a grab bag of what people do with their spawn maturity. Uh, we've also seen about a third of our inflation be caused by new provider rewards. And then finally, 17% uh, of the inflation has been caused by the neuron fund. So that's actually taking maturity and, and uh, using it in an SNS swap uh, through the neuron fund. Uh, there's been 2.5 million ICP used in that way. Um, and then if you look at that 3.8% and you say, hey, actually, uh, the um, voting rewards alone should be around 6 to 7% inflation. Uh, how come we're below that? It's uh, because people uh, are still, NNS participants are still vastly preferring to keep their voting rewards as um, as maturity. So I think especially when you look across like eight year neurons, I imagine almost everyone or most of them have, uh, they're staking their maturity. Um, so it's, it's staying locked in the NNS. Uh, if we move to the next slide, changing gears a little bit, um, I've been making the case in some of in different forums about the fact that um, burn rate is really high already in October. Uh, our cycle burn rate is is uh, set an all time high uh, for a month, and we still got another week to to finish out this month. Um, so the network activity on ICP is is at an all time high. Uh, I also talked recently about how it seems last year and this year that there's kind of a summer doldrum, maybe a drop in network activity. Uh, and I want to provide a little bit more metrics on that. So to add more context, what you're seeing here, oh, go back one slide, sorry, Jan. Uh, if you go back two slides. Uh, so what you're seeing here is unique internet identity logins. So these are unique anchors on any given day. You can see starting in late September, we saw almost a doubling or a tripling. Um, that kind of coincides with the increase in network activity. Um, so now these aren't necessarily daily active users. This is a subset of daily active users, right? Because you can use a, an internet computer app without logging in. Um, you can also use it by logging in with NFID or plug, um, other, other types of wallets that won't actually show up in the stats. Um, now, if we go to the next slide, you see a similar behavior on ICP wallets being active. Starting in late September, we started seeing a, a, a massive uptake on ICP wallet activity. I don't think I, ICP wallet is probably one of the metrics you would compare across the blockchain space um, because a lot of blockchains are transaction focused. ICP being a general compute layer is obviously not as as focused on the transactions, but you still see um, see this general adoption uh, growing really quickly in, 
uh, October as well. And this metric, um, if we go to the final slide, just to point out, there's also, uh, so if you monitor what we call meaningful wallets, so wallets with a balance of two ICP or more, um, that's actually grown as just a, I mean, this is your classic up into the right chart uh, for the last three months. Um, so this actually is, is not even just like a summer doldrum thing. This is actually just for whatever reason, we've, we've really been growing a lot in, in terms of our wallet usage. Um, I've been looking across ways to measure, like, is it one specific app? Um, we don't collect a lot of data on specific apps, so it's hard to identify like what's causing a lot of this increase. Um, looking at subnet data, though, uh, I'm seeing broad uptake in usage across um, most of the subnets. So I actually think this is just general uh, network activity growth, not just one or two specific apps um, uh, growing rapidly. If you have any questions, feel free to drop them in the chat. And um, if not, then uh, thanks, for, thanks for the time. Thanks so much, Kyle. It's really great to see how these wallets are growing. I hope uh, that trend continues, uh, well, even accelerates, I guess. Uh, I want to repeat, like, if you have questions, please uh, put them into the chat so we can uh, also address those questions. Uh, but yeah, so let's move on. So the next one is uh, by Michael on canister testing, and I'm really wondering how much of IC fits into a pocket. <laughs> um, hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Michael from the testing and verification team. Uh, I don't really, I can't really answer that question yet. But uh, the news I'm here to spread is that we have released a Rust library for Pocket IC. So what is Pocket IC? Um, it is a canister testing solution for the internet computer, which is fast and deterministic. A few weeks ago, uh, we released the first version of Pocket IC together with a Python library, and we have now followed up with a Rust library. And this was possible because Pocket IC is in principle just a server that runs locally on your system that is listening on a REST API. And uh, the libraries that we have published communicate with this REST API and provide an idiomatic front end for your, uh, for your test code. So you may be wondering, what's the difference between testing with uh, uh, the effects and the local replica versus testing with uh, Pocket IC. Well, typically when you launch a local replica with DFX, um, you use something like a bash script to call into your canisters and uh, test them and make asserts. And that is quite an experience. So contrast that with Pocket IC where you have to uh, download a binary and then import a test library, and then you can um, develop your tests natively, you know, uh, for example, in Rust. And um, we think that this is a much more ergonomic and much more safe way uh, to write tests than using a bash script. Um, or maybe um, your favorite language isn't supported yet. Maybe you want to write uh, your tests in some other language uh, apart from Rust or Python. And that is also possible because you can simply develop against um, the REST API in whatever language you want. And um, that's not just in theory. I mean, we didn't really know this until a few days ago, but um, while the team was busy polishing the Rust library, um, Nathan from Definity had already noticed that Pocket IC exists and that it has a REST API. And he has taken this opportunity and built a small TypeScript library um, for Pocket IC. And he used it to run his own canister tests. And of course, we're grateful for Nathan's pioneering. And on the next slide, um, I just want to show you his speed gains. Um, so using the local replica with the effects, uh, took his, his nine tests approximately 53 seconds. And when he switched to Pocket IC, that was just under two seconds. And of course, I have to say this, um, it's just one anecdote, it's just one developer, um, but I do hope that this these numbers motivate you to have a look into testing with uh, Pocket IC. And while I cannot promise anything, I think 
Nathan might release his TypeScript uh, library very soon. And then we have three languages uh, ready for usage and uh, you can check it out. And yeah, we would appreciate feedback, feature requests and all that. And in the meantime, we are exploring new features for Pocket IC, such as uh, multi subnet support. For now though, that's all from my side. Thank you, Michael. Great. Uh, I guess that pocket will become really hot if it's so much faster than just a local replica. So maybe you need some uh, fireproof trousers here. <laughs> so let's, let's move on. I guess uh, one of the biggest challenge for SNS uh, was to sort of figure out what, what their market cap should be and then how to divide the share between what they would ask from the community and what they would ask from the Neurons Fund. And uh, yeah, Björn Asman, I bet you have some nice news here. Yeah, thank you, Jan. Yeah, so this is Björn from the uh, research team. Um, yeah, so indeed, uh, we are um, uh, currently working on some enhancements of the Neurons Fund, which is, um, as Jan already said, a vehicle to support um, SNS launches. Uh, what it contains, like these enhancements, like uh, two features. Uh, one is um, matched funding. So the idea is that uh, the uh, the fund should co contribute aligned with what like the uh, the swap co collects from direct participants, and the second one is uh, make it more clear uh, in the UX in particular uh, what funds are coming from direct participants versus from the neural neurons fund. So why do we do this? Well, I mean that was uh, addresses community feedback. It has, has been raised many times in the forum. Also, I think it is um, uh, was raised by SNS projects. So like the matched funding scheme. Um, leads to improved, improved incentives for projects and also streamlines the decision making for those neurons which participate in the neurons fund. And the distinct swap contributions uh, creates transparency in the success metrics, offers SNS swap, uh, and just uh, generally adds to user clarity. Um, how we do this is, I mean, for the matching um, scheme, like we introduce um, a matching function, an S shaped function, which we'll see a bit more detail um, later in the deck. And uh, for the um, uh, distinct swap contributions, an update for the um, SNS launchpad is planned, uh, so to make this more visible. Uh, this feature here is uh, joint work with Pete, Asha, Uyer, Artem, and Lawrence. Next slide, please. So as a quick recap, um, um, so there are two avenues how you can participate in an SNS swap. So the primary avenue is direct um, direct contribution. So any user can participate by the SNS launchpad, uh, essentially you provide in ICP as an input, and after the swap, if it's successful, uh, you end up as an owner of SNS neurons. There's a second avenue, the neurons fund. Uh, so here is, the, if you have an NNS neuron, you can tick a box in the uh, NNS frontend um, DAP, uh, and via that tick box, you can join or also leave later on this fund at any time. If you um, tick it, then you expose the maturity that you have earned with that neuron to future participations and SNS launches. Uh, and what, what, but one crucial difference is that after a successful swap, you uh, don't become an owner of SNS neurons, but actually you get hotkeys so that you can actually vote, but the ownership actually is, is not with you. So that's a bit of background. Now let's come back on the next slide, please, to the um, fun matched funding scheme. So um, as already mentioned, I mean, the, the fundamental idea is very simple. Uh, you know, the contribution of the fund should scale aligned with the, what is collected from direct participants. I mean, this is not currently the case. Currently, the Neurons Fund actually contributes with a fixed amount. And that leads to the sort of unfortunate situation that for quite a few SNSs, actually, the Neurons Fund is like the, provides the majority of the funds. So it's, it, it's, that does not really consider sort of market signals picking, like distinguishing between sort of successful or less successful SNSs. Uh, and this will now change with like this uh, matching scheme. Um, you can see it in the, in the picture on the right hand side. So the X axis presents the direct uh, participants and the Y axis then the resulting uh, contribution from the neurons fund. And um, the um, uh, I already mentioned it's like an S-shaped function here that was chosen sort of to uh, create uh, a good incentives. Um, there are essentially three phases, uh, which are also here labeled with a, with a color code. Uh, so like the first phase is like a lag phase. So up to uh, 100k USD, uh, the neurons fund doesn't contribute anything. 
then it starts to scale up contributing up to um, a threshold of 300k. Uh, and then at that point, it, it contributes to, uh, with a ratio of sort of uh, two to one. Uh, so, and that's that initial phase sort of is meant to give a strong incentive for projects really to to uh, to, uh, yeah, to pass that initial hurdle so that actually the neuron fund will contribute. So, uh, uh, and then you come in, in the growth phase, that's phase number two. Uh, so if you reach that phase, you consider it to be like a very viable project. Uh, and now the neurons fund will contribute more. Um, um, and um, reaching at the, at the 500K threshold, uh, a one-to-one -one contribution. Uh, and afterwards in the phase three, um, the uh, that's a separation phase. It's the contribution will start to level off uh, uh, because, like the um, the the matching function is capped at ten percent of the uh, overall maturity in the neurons fund, and um, and the the reason for that capping is that no single project can take sort of or can drain the neurons fund, but so it's open also to support other initiatives that follow. Yeah, so I think the overall concept is very simple, but I think it, it, it provides a nice way for incentives um, and also uh, introduce an element of gamification um, in, in this uh, in the SNS swap. All right, yeah, so that's all I want to say here. On the next slide, please, you see the second component, uh, the distinct swap contributions. So um, yeah, um, people requested to really make it much more clear in the UX to uh, really see what's coming from direct participants versus the neurons fund. This now led to two adjustments. Um, the one actually is uh, in the proposal structure as well, so that um, uh, like a project that submits an SNS proposal specifies funding targets only with respect to the direct participation. Uh, and the contribution from the neurons fund then is to be considered then an add-on. Uh, so like that's one element. And then more importantly, on the right-hand side, uh, the launch pad is then adjusted so that uh, you can really clearly see uh, how is how much is collected only from the direct participants over time as well, so that you get a feeling on sort of how the uh, project is really doing. Uh, and then in addition, you see in a separate line the commitment from the neurons fund. Okay, then I come to my final slide. Um, so what's the status here? So the motion proposal um, was approved end of September. Uh, now the implementation is ongoing, actually in its final stage. The release is planned for early, mid-November. If you want to learn more about it, please follow this link here that brings you to the motion proposal and also to has links to the forum discussion where you have further details and background on this feature. Yeah, so I'm looking forward to the to this release. I think it will be a, a good good enhancement. And back to you, Jan. Thanks, Bjorn. Very exciting. Some of you might have seen like a tweet a few weeks back where somebody traded ICP on Uniswap for $80 and maybe also have wondered what the heck is going on here. I guess, Paul, what, what actually is going on? All right. So ICP on Ethereum, uh, it was a um, project that's put together in a, just a, in a couple of weeks by a, a small team. I think uh, Ben was the main contributor laying, the, laying out the design and also the foundational work. So it's a proof of concept. And the main purpose is to provide an ERC-20 token on Ethereum for ICP. So it's one-to-one -one backed by real ICP that's uh, held in uh, um, I I IC canister. So the purpose is to demonstrate um, the main purpose is to showcase the, the cross-chain capabilities of chain key technology. So now we have a canister on the IC side, we have a, a smart contract on the Ethereum side, how they can communicate with each other, how information can flow from one to the other. Um, although it's built in a short time, but it, it's actually built upon uh, very powerful technologies on the IC, like like the HTTP outcall and threshold ECDSA signatures. Uh, hopefully, once this goes out of the the proof of concept stage, we can we can see more usage of this token uh, in in the Ethereum uh, ecosystem, perhaps tradable on um, DeFi projects like Uniswap. So um, the the main idea here is that the we mint ICP token on the Ethereum smart contract. 
by first depositing some ICP token to the minter canister on the IC, right? So after that, the user can have uh, the ERC20 tokens on Ethereum, then the user can um, can freely trade it among each other, or, or uh, they can also call a burn function on the ERC20 contract to burn the ICP, to burn the ERC20 ICP, then on the cancer side, on the IC side, the user will get back the real ICP. Just to show you how uh, minting works. So suppose there's a user, uh, she will first deposit some ICP into a sub account that's owned by the, by actually owned by the minter. Then the minter canister, uh, there's a function called mint CKICP. Then the user will call this method on the minter. The minter will then go and check the balance on the ledger and move over, move the balance to the minter's account. So th this is by the sub account mechanism. Uh, once we have ICLC2, then actually I think we already have ICLC2 on, on the ICB ledger. We'll be moving this into a to a, a approval uh, approved workflow. So that's a little bit a bit easier. Anyway, the minter after it moves the ICP deposit ICP to the minter's account, then uh, it will return to the user a canister signed receipt. So here is where the communication happens. The receipt is a canister signed message and the user will get the actual message uh, and the user will then be able to submit it to the ERC20 contract on Ethereum. So the Ethereum contract in the contract itself, it's able to verify this is a message that's actually signed by a canister uh, on IC, the minter canister. And it will only allow this token to be minted after verifying the signature and confirm that uh, the amount, the the the, uh, the sender, and all that they they all checks out. Then it, it will you will issue the ERC twenty token to the user. So this kind of offline, you can say, is offline because it's uh, the the message is carried through a concrete signed message and the user is responsible to forward this message from from getting it from the cancer and then forward it to the ERC20 uh, token. So um, just to, right now we have integrated ICP uh, ERC20 token in the OEC wallet. You can see on the, on the right, um, but we haven't really integrated the UI for the minting process. So right now I have a script that does the minting. So I'm going to send some like 1.1 ICP to this address. You'll notice this address is ERC20 or Ethereum address actually shown here, right? So um, I'm going to start this process. And it's, it's saying uh, you need to send a little bit extra to this uh, sub account. So here is my NNS wallet. I'm going to just send some token to this address and 1.1. Just send it now. We should be able to see it. This script will uh, be able to pick it up. All right, I think it's sent. Oh, sorry. Uh, it's saying current balance remainder. I think I, yeah, I added one extra zero. Sorry. <laughs> Need to remove a zero. You have to send 1.1, 1 .1, right? Right. This, this is checking that there's already this balance is all received. It's going to call the minter canister. Minter canister right now is making a signature. Um, and it will send back to, to the script, and the script will then call into the uh, ERC20 uh, contract. So this is creating a if uh, transaction. 
So now we have this transaction created. We can go check it here. We can see that it's pending. So after some time, it will be accepted and, and the balance will reflect it here in OEC wallet. So while we're waiting for that, we can move to the next. So besides minting, uh, we can also do uh, like normal transfer, but, but other than that, we can also burn, which is going the other direction, going from ERC20 to the real, back to the real ICP. So what the user does here is just to call a function on a ERC20 contract it is burned to ICP, given some address, uh, uh, the account ID on the IC ledger and amount of token the user wish to burn, right? Then this ERC20 contract once executed the transaction, you emit a burn event to the event log. And here the minter canister will be using HTTPS outcall to monitor this event log. So here we can see that this kind of uh, 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 communication data communication is from the minter actively polling the data on the event log. Once it's noticed there's a burn event, you will examine the content of that event and be able to uh, move the, the given amount of ICP to the account indicated in the burn event. So this is how uh, the, the actual burn works. Right, we can see in the wallet, we have already received 1.1 ICP, right? So within the, the OEC wallet, um, we can actually initiate this burn by sending it to uh, the IC network, right? So you can choose Ethereum network, that is to send to another Ethereum address, but you can also choose to convert to the native ICP. Here you need to input a ICP account ID. Uh, for which I'm just going to use my own account ID to send it back. I'm going to send 1.1 back. So uh, I'll just click send. So this this whole workflow is already integrated in the OEC wallet. Once the transaction is signed, it's going to be submitted to the Ethereum network and uh, we'll later uh, get get the transaction ID and we'll be able to verify uh, insufficient fund. I think is because of the gas fee. All right, yeah. Um, okay, I'll I'll be doing this uh, offline. I I will submit this. I will put the the transaction uh, URL into the chat so that people can verify that the burn uh, actually happened. All right, uh, we have already open sourced the code. You can check it out. Besides the current proof of concept, we plan to further improve it, like using the proof workflow, uh, or maybe even change the, the minting uh, process. Right now, the user has to pay the gas fee for the minting. Um, perhaps we can let the minter canister pay the gas fee so that it will be only one direct call to the canister then the cancer can, can make the transaction and send it to Ethereum by itself. So that's one possible way of doing it other than the current implementation. Um, on the burn side, we can also decentralize the API providers. Right now it's only using uh, like one API provider to, to submit transactions and check event logs. Uh, of course, there's more testing to do and uh, eventually we want to do a security audit before we decentralize the control of this winter canister, uh, maybe to, to the NFS. Um, all right, that's it. If you have any questions, just put in the chat. Back to you, Ian. The first demo is uh, for, for our Motoko friends, and it's about Motoko stable regions. Well, I guess stable regions always sounds very nice and attractive, uh, but I'm really wondering what this means for Motoko. Cloud, you tell me. Okay, so first I should say this is more of a lecture and less of a demo, but Paul just gave a demo, so I'm fine. Um, so Motoko Stable Regions are a new language feature of Motoko, and um, they're basically providing a better abstraction for growing reading and writing IC stable memory. Uh, so we actually provided access before, 
uh, but that access was non-modular. So we're trying to get a more modular way of reading and writing stable memory. Um, and ideally, we'd like to replace the old legacy library, experimental stable memory mode that nobody could pronounce. Um, the way we do this is we actually extend the language. We're not just adding a library, we're adding a new type called region. And regions are actually uh, multiple. So you can have many regions active at any one time. And they're all isolated from each other, but represent different chunks of stable memory. They can grow uh, independently, and they're also stable. So if you want to like communicate a region to a future version of your canister, you just store it in a stable variable, and it can pick it up and then access all the memory stored at that region. Um, right. So, oh, next slide, please. Uh, so here's a little refresher. So on the IC, every canister actually has access to two memories. There's a 32-bit main main memory, which you can kind of think of as RAM, um, that is limited in capacity. You have up to four gigabytes, but it has fast and cheap access via native WASM instructions. Now, like, like RAM, it's kind of volatile. So when you upgrade a canister, the RAM is discarded, and you have to start from a fresh memory. Um, the second memory you have access to is 64-bit stable memory, and that you can think of like an SSD. So it's got a larger capacity. Uh, currently, it's 96 gigabytes and seems to be growing, uh, but it's slower and more expensive to use because you have to access it via system calls. So you're not using native, native WASM instructions, but it has a distinct advantage that's preserved on upgrade. So this gives canisters a way of saving data from one version of the canister to the next by storing it in stable memory. In fact, that's the only way you can communicate data from an old version to a new version of a canister. Next slide, please. So Motoko actually abstracts IC stable memory as a language feature already. This feature is called stable variables. Uh, and Motoko, every actor field that's declared stable lives in main memory, just like other fields, but it has a special property that when you do an upgrade, the state of that variable will be saved to stable memory automatically. And when you come up from the upgrade in the new version of the canister, the state of that stable variable will be restored from IC stable memory before execution resumes. So it's a very simple mechanism for transferring data from old version to new. But it involves a copy in, copy out step. So we transfer memory from main me transfer data from main memory into stable memory and then back out again. Now, an important thing also is that the stable memory format of these values, so once they're written to stable memory, is actually independent of compiler version. And this means that we can upgrade to code produced by a different Matoko compiler, which might actually use a different in main memory representation of values than the old previous version of the Matoko compiler. Next slide, please. So here's a, a very simple example. Suppose we have like a calculator app that provides a, a division operation, okay? That's simple. Um, but we want this calculator app to log all the successful operations in a log. Um, in Motoko, you can basically add a, a, a variable called OK, which is the log of OK operations. And then if you want it to be preserved, all you have to do is add the modifier stable to the variable declaration. And then the compiler will deal with all the rest of all the rest of the hassle of like saving the state to stable memory and restoring it from stable memory. Next slide, please. Even better, that that stable variable it's really just holding holding an ordinary Matoko value. So the, if you want to implement the data structure storing the log, the log, you just get to use ordinary Matoko data structures. Here we're using a record that contains a mutable field with a functional list in it, and Adding an entry to log is just pushing onto that list and updating it. So that's very nice and simple, but it has a fundamental problem. Because stable variables live in main memory when they're in use, they can never hold more than four gigabytes of data because we have that four gigabyte limit on main memory. Also, there's other problems which are more kind of design flaws at the moment that our representation, our stable format doesn't scale very well. Um, and we need to replace it. That's kind of independent. So let's go to the next slide, please. So the way this works pictorially, here I've got a canister that's that's just about to undergo an upgrade. And if you see the Matoko icons on the left, they're slightly different NFTs of Matoko to indicate different compiler versions. Okay. 
So let's say we're running along, we've got the values A, B, and C. These are stable values in main memory, and we decide to do an upgrade. So what happens is those values A, B, C are going to be written and serialized to stable memory in a slightly different format, which I've indicated here with the font, uh, courier font A, B, C. Once the upgrade happens, the stable variables are restored from stable memory into the new format in main memory, which I've indicated with, I can't remember what that font is called, but it's something strange. The first font was lobster font and the bottom font is something obscure. But anyway, it's a different format. Next slide, please. So stable variables come from main memory, can store at most four gigabytes, I just said that. So how can the token use the remaining 92 plus gigabytes of stable memory? So that's fine. Oop, back. Uh, back. Which one's like, so sorry, I'm, uh, my mouse wheel is a bit too triggery. Yeah, that's good. Stay. Yeah, so, so our first attempt was just to provide a library to give you access to the rest of stable memory. Okay, This was called the Experimental Stable Memory Library that nobody could pronounce. Um, and basically, this provides array-like access to full IC stable memory. And it's a very thin wrap around the IC system calls. Um, all it's really adding is some convenience function for writing that values of different scalar sizes, like NAT8, NAT16, blah, blah, blah. Um, the implementation is very simple. It just maintains a virtual page size to conceal the extra space that was required for storing stable variables. So here's how this works. Next slide, please. Yeah. Next slide. Right. So here we're doing the upgrade. We've already got some data in stable memory that, that the user has written. That's this kind of sandy color on the on the bottom. Um, and to serialize our data, we just take the stable variables in A, B, and C, and we write them to the end of stable memory, leaving the existing stable memory data there in place. And when we come back from the upgrade, we just copy the data back out, and everything is hunky-dory. And notice that the data that was already in stable memory doesn't have to move, which is very convenient when you have large amounts of memory. Next slide, please. So. That all worked pretty well. It's cheap and cheerful, but it has a drawback. And really, all we're doing is exposing a single rollable array of bytes. It's a single global variable, essentially, which is a shared resource. So if one library wants to use it, say to add a log, then another library can't without further coordination, right? So it's just not modular. Uh, in our calculator example, so it would be easy to implement one stable log, as we did. But if we then wanted to add further logs or other stable data structures, then we'd be screwed. And it'd be much harder. Next slide, please. So our second attempt to prove the situation is to generalize the notion of experimental stable memory to not from one single memory to a bunch of little memories, which we call regions. So now we're the API is very similar. It's a new library and a new type. The API is very similar to ESM, except instead of having just one memory, we have multiple regions. Regions are allocated by calling region.new. That gives you a fresh region that nobody else has access to unless you hand them access. And then every operation we use to read and write the region takes an additional argument, which is the region we want to operate on. So you can think of the regions as kind of capabilities and the operations as um, things you can do given that capability. Now, the implementation is actually more complicated than the previous one, because under the hood, we have to maintain a region allocator to service these new requests. And we also have to map the logical region pages down to physical stable memory pages. Next slide, please. OK, so this picture is probably totally incomprehensible, but it's just a slight variation of the previous one. So here we've got. Um, stable variables, A, B, and C, as we had before. But we also have stable regions, R1 and R2. And I'm using the, the green shades to indicate which portions of stable memory they uh, own. Okay, And so now when you do an upgrade, we just do the same thing again. We copy the stable values into stable memory, into the stable format. And the stable memory pages that were used by the regions are actually just remaining in place. We do the upgrade. We copy the values back into the heap, and maybe in a slightly different format because we change the compiler, and we proceed. Next slide, please. So, I mean, 
it's still a low level library, right? You're 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 basically writing to byte arrays. Uh, I guess probably like using an array buffer in in JavaScript. Uh, but the advantage here is that we can implement abstractions that implement the same interface as a naive Motoko implementations, but have much better scalability properties. So here, this is the implementation of the log using regions. It's lower level, more complicated, more code, and easier to get wrong. But it implements the same API as the previous uh, list-based log. So we can use it as a drop-in replacement in uh, the calculator app. Next slide, please. And moreover, so that's what we're doing here. We've got our, our calculator app. And we have one stable variable for the log of OK operations. And now we've decided to add a log to track failures. And because the regions of the two logs are completely isolated from each other, they're independent, they don't interfere, this is a completely modular addition. So we just instantiate a new log, store it in stable variable error, and write to the log whenever division fails. So a nice modular use of, of regions. So let's go next slide, please. OK, so I should wrap up. Um, so in summary, regions provide utilization of all available stable memory. So those region-based logs would scale to 96 gigabytes. Um, they provide multiple logical partitions with independent access and growth. So every client of a region can use it independently and grow it at will. And these regions are always fully isolated. So writing to one region will never interfere with another one. Regions are stable types, so they integrate nicely with Motoko's existing stable variables. So you can have a mixture of the two modes. You can use stable variables that hold like a, a lightweight metadata data structure that points into memory of stored in regions, stable memory. So they're available in Motoko 0.10, not yet in DFX. Um, and we have future plans to support disaster recovery of regions. So we're careful to maintain all the metadata for regions in stable memory. So if something goes wrong, with your canister, you should be able to recover the data just by looking at the, the stable memory data. Um, and we can also gar in future garbage collect regions. So the idea is if a region value goes out of scope, is no longer reachable, then all the pages allocated to that region can be recycled and used to grow other regions that are still live. Anyway, that, that's me. Thanks very much. Thanks, Alessandro for this uh, nice uh, demo of your presentation skills. <laughs> Next up, uh, we have Diego. And actually, so we, we've heard quite a few times from developers and other people that, uh, you know, like the, a lot of the information they need is actually hidden somewhere in the forum, forum some forum posts, some question. And it's actually very hard to wade through all those posts. And so we've heard that. And uh, Diego has done, done something about it. Diego, what did you do? Well, a few other people helped me, so I don't want to take full credit. But <laughs> I, uh, so we have an, we deployed an LLM um, and we integrated the front end to the developer docs website so that people can start using it. Um, this was deployed nine days ago, and we have an average of almost 100 people, 100 different conversations a day. So people are using this much more than like the developer forum, for example, or even in Discord. So it's already grown um, quite significantly. And it's trained on the ICP website, the ICP wiki, the developer documentation. It's trained on the form because the form has a lot of questions people have asked and a lot of good answers. So we tap to that as well. Uh, definitely academic papers. Uh, as, and people start so, suggesting other things. So the ASL, the Kybra documentation has been updated. Uh, we Somebody pulled the C++ SDK from the community. We've been updating that. So we've been training the LLM on documentation as well as manual from when we see the wrong answer, we edit it. So let's go to the next slide. I'll show you guys a few slides before I get to the demo. So uh, one thing that it could do, it could help people with Motoko or Rust or any kind of code. So in this example, I asked it to write a Hello World contract in Motoko, and it was able to do it pretty well. I was able to review it, and it works. Um, let's go to the next slide. An interesting use case is that um, I saw some people do is, people can take Solidity code. So somebody posted a Solidity code and said, hey, can you convert this to Motoko? And the LLM was able to do exactly that. So it was able to take the Solidity code from Motoko, which is obviously very helpful if you're a new entrant to the ICP space. So what I want to show you guys is, um, so um, 
one of the things that I realized is we could look at the conversations people have been saying, and and some of them are pretty pretty intense. So, for example, in this conversation, somebody pasted a whole lot of code, which you can't really see very well, but somebody said, can you remove the email and password authentication of the code below? And it generated code, which I could see it works well. And then the user was able to ask questions following through, uh, which is all pretty good. Um, and we can review the, the, the conversation to see if there's anything wrong the LLM says, because obviously we don't want the LLM to hallucinate. That's a very important point to this whole thing. So we want to keep improving it. So we do manually update it when we see questions that are incorrect from the LLM that helps train it. Um, and just over here, the sources are, so we we just recently updated uh, some academic documentation that Yen sent us. And, and as people, the Motoko book we just added, and even the Discord. Um, so it's a, uh, it's pretty good. Um, and just to remind people, it, right now we have it in the developer documentation, but we can put it anywhere else. It's right here in the bottom right-hand corner. And we could ask it anything we want about the internet computer. Um, so let's just ask it a quick question. Um, let's see here. Um, write the Hello World Rust contract for ICP. Let's, I haven't asked this question, so let's see what it does. So it's writing, uh, so far everything looks pretty good just from reading it. Okay, so, yeah. So far everything it says is pretty accurate. I'll probably change the order, so I'll probably go in and modify like how it explains things because uh, <clears throat> I would suggest to the reader to do a few other things to install. Um, but yeah, that is the LLM. I'm just gonna switch, but I'm gonna let John share the screen. I have one last slide. I actually tried a few things. Um, even tried to help, I deployed a model to OpenAI myself and just play with it. But the few requirements that we're looking for that really kind of make this work a little better for us is one that we didn't just want to have a model. We wanted to have it have data sources like a wiki, PDFs, it even the ICP medium and put in a vectorized database we can retrieve, which is totally doable, but just kind of a pain to do like, now we have to manage a vectorized database. So that was like a requirement. And the other one requirement is we want to be able to review and train answers manually easily. So we want to make it easy for, for example, the right now the definitive customer support team is going through the questions and they could see what is incorrect and they could update it. So they could, we could have more people jump in and like improve the model. And then the, the third thing, which was kind of a pain from just to my own model, was that um, we want to be able to constantly update the sources. So the developer forms constantly changing, the developer docs are constantly changing. So we wanted to have a, a, an LM platform that was basically doing cron jobs to just constantly check in to see what has changed and take the divs and then change the model. Um, so that, that's also very important because we're, we're constantly improving the documentation based on what we learned. Um, that's it. If anybody has any questions, feel free to put them in the chat. Thank you, Diego. Uh, I think this is uh, really nice and nice to see how all this translation also works. So next up we have uh, Agoram and because we have learned a lot already today and now I'm really curious how we can even learn more about Web3 and uh, ICP and uh, everything else. All right, uh, so nice to meet you. My name is Ethan Klein. I'm COO, uh, co-founder of Agarap, and my colleague Roman, CTO, will be helping handling the chat. So if you guys have any questions. Um, so what we have built uh, is a Web3 education and training marketplace. So we developed a interactive develop environment that's agnostic for different uh, Web3 programming languages. And as of right now, we uh, support Motoko and currently working on uh, Azel, actually, it was nice to see Pocket IC because uh, we are also collaborating with them. And really, the vision is to uh, make a Udemy Code Academy education uh, model for Web3 um, and more specifically to support ICP. So the problem uh, right now is a lot of education is, are static read-only docs and videos. 
Uh, also, uh, utilizing crowdsourcing like Udemy does with courses, but through an interactive development environment, um, isn't something right now common or in the Web 2 or Web 3 uh, scene. And so how we're doing this is creating that IDE. Uh, we took the model like Code Academy did with from their ID. Um, and we're also planning to build a sort of a community ID where uh, ICP community members uh, can actually build their own course content um, by actually having the ID locally with them. Um, so why ICP? Um, even up through the, the bulls and bears, uh, you've always steadily grew your developer development community. And so, and that has to do with use development growth. Um, we'd like to, you know, have that goal and help ICP, you know, reach that uh, 100,000 in uh, mark uh, for developers. Uh, so how the uh, bit about the product. So if you go to agrap.dev, uh, we currently have a course catalog that where is a filter function. And so you can actually currently see uh, what ICP courses we have available, which is one Motoko course and a Motoko tutorial plus a challenge there. Uh, we also have made our ID embeddable. Um, and you can actually also check that out on the documentation. Uh, we have an embeddable ID uh, with the intercomputer there that you can check out. You'll actually see the demo video that will go a little more detail with that. In a couple of weeks, we're actually launching what we call competition challenges. Uh, and this will actually include a leaderboard. And what it will be is the basic top optimized code. Uh, the top three leader, uh, leaders users will receive a monetary uh, reward um, in ICP. Uh, and we're also going to be launching security challenges where you can uh, get a reward for hacking a smart contract. Um, more on the uh, on the application is our account page. So you can actually, what you study and learn, you can see where you complete and also where you rank uh, within the challenges and competitions that we will be launching on Agra. Hello, let me show you what we did uh, for our last uh, grant from Definitive. If you go to the uh, Motoko programming language documentation, you will notice that there's this new section, Motoko interactive tutorial. And this is what we did. Uh, it's basically a tutorial consisting of around uh, 40 lessons, where in each lesson we introduce you to one concept from a Motoko programming language. So for example, let's have a look at the immutable variables lesson. Here, first, we explain what immutable variables are and give you a simple exercise, which is code on the right does not compile, we'll fix it. So let's do that. I can see that uh, in this statement, uh, the assignment tar target uh, is not mutable. So let's make it mutable. The error goes away. I can run the code and see the output. Of course, this lesson was uh, very simple. The subsequent lessons are more complex than this. So for example, let me show you the lessons that focuses on arise. So the like explanation part here is longer. There's an exercise that's more complex. And if you get stuck, uh, you can uh, press this show solution button, which shows you the solution for the exercise. Uh, the ID itself uh, is uh, pretty convenient. It's not just a text field, but it gives you things you would expect from the IDE, like auto-completion. So as you can see, it, it shows me what variable and functions are available as I'm typing. And again, I can run the code and uh, see the output. Uh, I would also also would like to show you our main platform where the tutorial is also available, which is called which is at agora.dev. Uh, and what we do is that uh, we basically uh, we are or we are creating an online education platform for various platforms. Internet computer is one of them. So here I went to our course catalog and I can filter for courses for internet computer. 
At the moment, uh, there's just multiple tutorial and there's one challenge. Challenges are small exercises uh, where you have to solve some problem or maybe optimize for efficiency and uh, then have your score visible on the leaderboard. And in the future, we would like to add more courses. Uh, so currently, we're planning the course on ASL and also to add more challenges. So that's all from me. Thank you for your attention. Um, so just briefly, uh, the current size of the developer community is 26 point million in Web2. Um, so that that's the amount of people we could target for beginners that would join um, the ecosystem. Um, and then when it comes to senior developers that would be working on different challenges, right now there's currently 21,300 active Web3 use, uh, developers out there. Uh, and as of today, uh, Matoko Education, we've had 208 users um, perform on the Matoko tutorial and the Learn Matoko course. And so our real vision, um, where we want to jump into is having a crowdsource education. So um, this would allow uh, users to be able to create their own courses and challenges. And then similar to the Udemy model, be able to monetize uh, those courses. And the current uh, roadmap right now, we're uh, in another uh, grant with Affinity. We're building uh, the runtime for ASL programming language and developing a very similar uh, tutorial, as you saw with Motoko. Uh, next step is then our crowdsource education implementation. And then finally, we end with uh, having a, a job, our, our job board events and grants recommendation engine um, from what courses users uh, solved. Um, in our current model right now, we're, we do B2B uh, specifically for uh, grants that sustain our team. But in the future, we're looking at the to do uh, more B2C, uh, again, with that Demi-like models where we take a percentage cut from the creators in our system. And this is our team. Um, our founder and CEO is a senior uh, blockchain developer who's been in the scene since 2017. Um, both uh, Roman and Peter, uh, as CTO and head of product, they've uh, been Web2 developers for 20 20 years, but have now, uh, last couple of years, gone into Web3. Um, and same as Yakub, who is our backend developer, who's uh, been in the Web3 scene since uh, 2018. Uh, and myself, I run and support uh, operations and do product management uh, for the Agarap team. Um, thank you very much. Well, thanks, everybody, for attending. You can watch the recording of uh, Global R&D on YouTube and tune in to this. Uh, global r and the next one and all previous ones. Thanks a lot. Goodbye.